Part 2 of The Cult of the Black Cube, A Saturnian Grimoire by Arthur Moros. Overview. This book presents an overview into the worship and gnosis of the Saturnine deity, sometimes called the Black Sun or the Black Cube, a unique entity that has been venerated by many cultures for thousands of years. It is intended primarily to be used by practicing occultists, but is designed to be accessible also to insightful readers of other backgrounds. For the purposes of nomenclature, this work refers to the god as the Saturnine deity rather than Saturn, primarily because Saturn is merely the Roman name for an entity that transcends the limitations of Italic mythology. Names are important, to be sure, but in the case of a deity that has multiple names, it may be better to avoid naming it consistently after a single cultural norm. As the author of the Picatrix makes plain, him which someone calls Saturn, another may call Kronos, Sani, Samadhi, Kivan, Tezcatlipoca, or even the Black Cube. This deity has been treated by various authors from their own unique cultural perspective. For example, the reader may be aware of The Greatness of Saturn by Robert Svoboda. Other authors have addressed the Saturnine deity indirectly or included him among other deities, as in the case of Pseudo, Armagritis, Gayat er Hakim, the translation of which is better known in the West as the above mentioned Picatrix. Nevertheless, if one accepts for a moment that the occult addresses actual deities which themselves transcend cultural boundaries, then one must acknowledge that a culture specific approach might, or indeed must, have limitations that are the result of a culture's bias. One of the most interesting occult exercises in the t is the tracing of the Saturn cult throughout the various cultures of the ancient world. This exercise is significant for various reasons. First, having studied five or six different ancient religious systems, it becomes clear that there are very few deities that are truly international insofar as maintaining their distinct traits across the cultural lines. Saturn is one of the rare few who appears in multiple cultures with the same essential characteristics. Here one might ask if all solar deities aren't generic, and the answer would be definitely no. The, Ra the Roman, Aztec, and Egyptian solar deities, for example, share almost nothing in common except for the obvious attribute of the shining disk. One might equally ask if oceanic deities are not all more or less the same, and the answer there again is no. They tend to be relatively unique apart from their connection to water. In any case, these aforementioned deities are tied to visible natural phenomena, and so one would expect them to have common traits, since the observation of the phenomena is not related to one's culture. When a deity or entity which represents more abstract concepts appears to carry those traits consistently across the cultural lines, it raises some very interesting questions of how and why the culture reveres that deity. In our modern esoteric culture, we unfortunately very often find practitioners insisting that a figure like Lilith is equivalent and non-different from Hecate and Kali because they are female deities with a dark side. This is an incredibly poor and dangerous reduction of complex cultural figures and symbols. One must be careful not to simply lump together different deities that share a certain vague portfolio of attributes, but not distinguishing stories or features. This book, however, will demonstrate that the Saturnine deity is not merely a series of similar gods, but rather the same entity, which is recognized and venerated, placated by multiple religions and occult systems.
This work presents its contents along three thematic sections. Scholarly materials. There is a great deal of ancient, medieval, and modern texts that deal with the mythology, worship, and veneration of Saturn across a wide range of cultures. Predominant cultures covered will include Classical, Greco-Roman, Islamic, and Indian, with references to Aztec and Afro-Caribbean spirituality where appropriate. This section of the book investigates the way scholars and specialists understand the way various cultures perceived and experienced the divine mandate and cosmic function of Saturn, a selected annotated bibliography which provides a discussion of sources for people who wish to carry out their own independent investigations will be found at the end of the book. Saturnine Theory This section investigates general discussions of magic and gnosis, together with personal views and knowledge gained through direct transmission from mentors, human and inhuman, about the Saturnine deity. It includes observations and speculations about the global cult of Saturn in its many forms, where the scholarly section is backed by hard facts and academic sources. This section is more Gnostic, interpretive, and anecdotal than the prior, but equally significant in terms of the information presented. Saturnine Practices the contemporary cultist of Saturn has a very wide range of historical practices from which to choose. This section explores various basic and advanced devotions and rites for those who wish to engage directly with the black cube and its chthonic energies. It also discusses some facets of contemporary occult practice, such as the role of sacrificial, the mechanics of Saturnine magic, and the ultimate goal of the practice of magic. Section 1 Scholarly Materials on Saturn Saturn in Islamic Texts Medieval Islamic cosmology, like the Indian and Hermetic cosmologies from which it borrows, considers that the seven planets of the solar system are not mere geological masses, but physical representations of celestial intelligences or powers. These seven planetary powers hold considerable influence over the day-to-day -day affairs of humanity and, indeed, all earthly life. Consequently, the serious student of celestial philosophy read magic, is able to gain some hold over these beings and thereby improve his lot on earth or alter the course of natural events for another person, issue, or region. In medieval Islamic esoterica, the figure of Saturn is a surprisingly popular figure. The Arabic word for the Saturnine deity is Zuhail, which means the one who is far away, or the alien. While many familiar with hermetic thought might like to claim that this concept of distance, or being alien, is borrowed from Greek thought, it has been definitely stated, definitively stated, that Zuhail was the Arabic name for Saturn long before the Arabs or Jews had become familiar with Greek learning. As Islam lacks any outright satanic current and its antimonian traditions are much more right-hand path than many would like to admit, the author would suggest that the cult of Zuhail took the role that Satanism came to fill in medieval Christianity. The Saturnine deity becomes the champion of the desperate, the greedy, the rebel, and vengeance-driven. It is highly significant that Zuhail appears in multiple Islamic manuscripts and that the details of the cult of Zuhail appear to have been well known to Arab authors, not as history but as actual practices 
which other Arabs were practicing well into the medieval period. Zuhel was not dimly remembered like some historical Quraysh deity such as Alat or Hubal, but was instead held to be an entity to which actual sections of the Quran were dedicated and to whom considerable power of fate was attributed. This tension is not ignored by the authors of the various esoteric manuscripts, and so the compilers of the Picatrix and Nabataean agriculture somewhat awkwardly try to turn the planet Saturn into some sort of angelic intelligence in the hopes of making its cult more palatable to devout Muslim readers. The various manuscripts insist on the one hand that Saturn is unique in that where the other planets have their own area of authority, Saturn's authority is over the planets themselves, and so the devotee of Saturn has the advantage of not only being able to appeal to Zuhel's own portfolio, discussed below, but also the possibility of using Zuhel's influence to overrule the other planetary powers. When examining the Islamic view of the Saturnine deity, one would do well to consider the source texts. One of the cardinal rules of any textual analysis is that when authors mean something, they'll repeat themselves. So, in scanning this text, we will look first for repetition, not word order, and terms, terms that are repeated will be flagged in bold. Since the text is in translation, it is reasonable to consider synonymic repetition as valid, as the oldest of the primary texts considered in this section. It would be wise to consider the words of Ibn Washia's treatise, Nabataean Agriculture. Ibn Washia writes of Zuhail, Beware the evil of this god when he is angered, or to the west of the sun, or veiled in its rays in the middle of its return. Pray to him this prayer which we have just given here. While you are praying this prayer, give a burnt offering to his idol, consisting of old hides, grease, strips of leather, and dead bats. Burn for him fourteen dead bats and an equal amount of rats. Then take their ashes and prostrate yourself on them in front of his idol. Prostrate yourselves to him in the form of a black stone on black sand, and seek refuge from him against his evil. Because, O oh my brethren and beloved ones, he is the cause of the perishing of all that perishes, the cause of decay of all that decays, the cause of perdition of all that is destroyed, the cause of sorrow of all the sorrowful ones and the weeping of all the weeping ones. He is the Lord of evil and sin and filth and dirt and poverty. This is what he does to men when he is angered. But when he is content, then he gives them existence, long life, fame after their death, acceptance in the eyes of those who look at them, and sweetness of speech. His anger is to be feared in situations like I just described to you, but his contentment is to be expected when he is east of the sun or in the middle of his course or in places which agree with his actions or in the full speed of his travel or in the cycle of his ascendance. If you pray to him when he is angered, repeat your prayer and the sacrifice when he is content and remind him of the earlier prayer, and repeat it to him, so that you might escape his evil. The text continues, but let us pause here momentarily. The text repeats such terms as evil, anger, prayer, black. These are not accidental repetitions, as the author is trying to stress the nature of the deity. Zuhel is connected with evil and is a power that can experience the emotional state that humans consider anger. This suggests two things. First, that Zuhel has emotions as a human 
and thus we can relate to him on some level. Second, that the deity is aware of human action and reacts to it. Further, the text repeats the verb pray and the noun prayer several times, which indicates that it is possible to communicate with this remote being, not as an equal, but as something greater. We also see, for the first time, the reference to the veneration of Saturn using a black stone to represent him. The examination of the repetition concluded. It is good now to see what terms remain. As a reminder, these words of Ibn Washia follow a traditional incantation to Zuhail. The text leaves no room for misunderstanding, as he clearly identifies Zuhail as the source of evil, decay, destruction, sorrow, and uncleanness. Ibn Washia expresses concern that Zuhal has a vindictive personality and a bad temper. Even the offerings to Zuhal are foul and uncouth. Rather than gold or incense, he is to be offered old hides, grease, strips of leather, and dead bats. It is important to note, while hides, grease, and leather are rather low-quality goods, the dead bats are actually carrion, that is filth, nahasa, in Islamic law, and so the offering of such to a spirit indicates that his character is sharply different than any of the angelic spirits attributed to the other planets, such as Jupiter or Venus. This places the spirit of Zuhel closer in resonance to the terrestrial jinn, which are said to be attracted to the dead, filth, and spilled blood. It's difficult to stress this in the English language, but the use of carrion is a tremendous taboo in Islam. Even handling it necessitates ablutions in some schools of jurisprudence. Any mainstream Muslim reading this invocation would be justifiably shocked to see that one would offer dead bats to Zuhal. But Ibn Washia continues, Know that he is the one who gives success in cultivation of the earth and growth, or its opposite, to plants. He revealed to the moon what I put down in this book of mine, and the moon revealed it to his idol, and I was taught it by the idol of the moon, just like I now teach it to you. Preserve this, because it is your life on which you rely and on it depends the growth of your fields and your fruits, which are the matter of your life and your hope during your lifetime of comfort, affluence, safety, and complete health. Know that I have prayed to this god Saturn, and in my prayer I have asked his idol to benefit with this book of mine, everyone who reads it, the idol revealed to me, your prayer has been heard and your offering accepted. I did this because I felt sorry for the sons of my kind, because of the anguish of their poverty and the abundance of their misery. Nabataean Agriculture, page 151. This section is very significant because the author admits that he's personally tried this particular spell praying to a black stone idol, and that Zuhel has directly spoken to him through the black stone. The term black stone is deliberately evocative of the black stone in Mecca, embedded in the Kaaba. As an educated Arab who uses Islamic language, Ibn Washia is deliberately pushing the envelope. The Saturnine deity can be further understood through some of the prayers directed towards it. Ibn Washia's Nabataean agriculture records a prayer to Zuhail, which the Picatrix compiler boasts both cites and includes in its entirety, indicating that it was considered highly effective. The text is slightly strange as it wanders between the second person, you, and the third person, he, but this style is likely in imitation of the Quran, which uses similar shifts of person. This spell will be discussed further below in the third section as a contemporary magical operation. 
Yet for the moment, it is good to note some of the characteristics of the deity which the spell outlines. The text reads, O Saturn, we address ourselves to you. Standing, we ask and we honor you with obedience and humility. We address you, standing and facing the exalted master, alive and eternal, solid in his power and dominion. He is eternal in his heaven and mighty in his dominion, focused in his efforts and his great works. He is over all. His power is over all living things on earth, and they endure by his endurance. By his power and his might, he began them, and he causes them to continue. He causes us to endure, and by his, in, his eternity and perpetuity, he brings permanence on earth. By his might, he causes the waters to ebb and flow. Living, he causes life to move because he is himself alive. He is cold as his nature. Through the influence of his high realm, his trees grow and the earth becomes heavy under the weight of his movements. If he wishes, he causes beings to become what they are not. Yet, he is wise and a creator by his might and intelligence. His knowing extends to all things. The text is lengthy, so it is good to pause again here for analysis. As we said above, the cardinal rule of any textual analysis is that when authors mean something, they'll repeat themselves. With this in mind, we note the repetition of the terms eternal, power, endure, and heavy weight. These, su these suggest a deity that is seen to be timeless or to have power over the course of time. It is good to indicate here that these are not terms that are used of the other six planetary gods, and since clearly those gods are quite ancient, we understand that Saturn is ancient in a truly cosmic sense. There are other significant terms here, but we will continue the review looking for repetition. We can return now to the text to see what terms are repeated. Hail, Lord of the heavens. May your name be holy, pure, and honored. We obey you. We address ourselves to your ancientness. We call you by your names, your ancientness, your nobility and honor. We demand from you whom we respect to strengthen our mind that it be strong and enduring, and dwell in us while we live. Then, when we die, ward off the worms and reptiles from our flesh. You are a merciful and ancient teacher, and no one can save the one you condemn. You are persistent in your words and deeds, and you regret not your acts. You are slow and profound in your powers. You are a master whose deeds cannot be undone, and what you did forbid cannot be done by another. You are respected in all your actions and unique in your kingdom. You are the lord of the other planets, and the very stars fear the sound of your movement and tremble before your gaze. We ask and demand you to avert your evil from us, and in your purity to treat us well. By your good and noble names, we avert your evil and we draw from your virtue. By your names, by your true name, which you love more than the others, treat us well and grant us what we ask. Here the word endurance appears again, and ancientness. There is a curious sort of paradox. Zuhail is said earlier in the spell to be eternal, yet later he is ancient at the same time. How then can an eternal being be old? Being eternal implies not experiencing the process of time or being outside of time. By ancient, then, the text must be stressing that the Saturnine deity is a truly primordial entity, 
unlike the other younger gods who follow later. The text also stresses the fact that the Saturnine deity is a deity of hardiness, endurance, though it is the tirelessness of a grizzled veteran rather than a young athlete. Like an old man, Saturn is heavy, sluggish, yet enduring. His power is not the flashy and quick magic of the sun or Mercury, and it is likely not invoked for fast results where the other planets might be, but it is a lasting power. If the reader suspects that the case for Saturn's malevolence has been overstated by the author, it would be wise to remember that the term evil, Arabic shar, occurs repeatedly across several texts. Also, the terms honor and evil appear as repeated terms in this very passage. These likewise appear to be a kind of contradiction. How can a being be evil or the source of evil, as a related text indicated above, and yet be honorable? The only possible answer is that, in the medieval mind, a deity or person could be malevolent and yet have a code of honor or at least some frame of reference which humans might possibly understand. Honor implies that the deity will acknowledge sacrifices and prayers made in its honor, and that it will react accordingly. Equally, it implies that the deity may be offended if it is approached without the proper respect and humility. This point may be jarring to many contemporary occultists who push for an anthrocentric narrative but it is necessary to stress that most traditional spiritual or occult systems, while operating from a human standpoint, have not placed man at the sacred center of their cosmology. If one accepts that deities, by whatever name, are actual and independent beings, then attempting to approach them as equals is the very definition of hubris and or stupidity. This is not to say that exclusive, subservient worship in the Abrahamic sense is necessary to work with a deity, but by comparison, one can speak to one's professional or political superior with deep and genuine respect without actually worshipping them. Having discussed those aspects of the text which are repeated, it is good to review those which occur on their own. Saturn is said to be cold, and this follows Islamic cosmology, which holds that planets and living beings are hot or cold by nature. Saturn is cold by nature, which could be because he is elderly, or else because he is a chthonic figure. The text also says that his power is slow, but this suggests the relentless grinding power of a glacier. It does not move quickly, but there is nothing which can resist its momentum. Even more significant is the line which states, You are the lord of the other planets, and the very stars fear the sound of your movement and tremble before your gaze. Ibn Washia is saying clearly that Zuhel is the master of the other powers and that they are subject to his will. He goes further, stating that the other deities actually fear Zuhail. This raises some very serious questions about why one deity would fear another. This point will be explored further below. We may now consider the Picatrix, which has a great deal to say about the character and resonances of Zuhail. While it has more in general to say about Zuhail than Nabataean agriculture, it was compiled later and uses the agriculture as one of its sources, so it is necessary to consider it second. We then look not only for repetition within the Picatrix itself, but try to see if it echoes any themes in Ibn Washia's works. On Zuhel, it reads Book 3.1. Saturn, for example, is the planet whose source holds great strength and has the knowledge of mysterious orbit and the power to obtain the reason behind things and the ability to find their intentions. 
the spell of wonders and knowledge of secret and mysterious issues. It also rules the Hebrew and Coptic languages and for external body parts, it rules the right ear, the outside parts and the spleen as an internal organ, which also is considered the source of the black mixture of the body and the joints and that which holds the whole parts together. Its fabrics, all kinds of rough fabrics, its professions, leather, tanning, farming, and building, mining, and it rules the repulsive tastes like the wild pear. As for locations, it rules black mountains, dark valleys, basements, wells, graveyards, and the wilderness. Its jewels, onyx, black stones, and lodestone. Its metals, lead, iron, and everything else that has turned black, putrefied, and stinky smelling. Its plants, oak, safflower, carob, palm tree, caraway, boxthorn, cumin, onion, and all hard-leaved plants and thorny, harmful trees. Its drugs, aloe, myrrh, their equivalent, wild castor oil plant, and wild colocynth. Its scents, wisteria and licorice. Its animals, every dark, black, and ugly animal, like black camels, sheep, pigs, wolves, monkeys, dogs, cats, and all birds with long necks and gruff voices like ostriches, buzzards, owls, vermin, crows, bats, cranes, and all stinking, dirty animals living underground. Its colors, black, dark colors, and gray, and finally, its symbol. We will employ the same technique as above and begin with those attributes that the Picatrix repeats both within itself or echoes from the Nabataean agriculture, which it cites at times. The text repeats the terms black or dark several times, stressing that black animals, trees, and minerals are sacred to Zuhel. The use of the term black stone is not accidental the Picatrix author is aware that the Saturnine idol is itself a black cube of some kind and is referencing the Kaaba as Ibn Washia has done prior. The text also references knowledge and secret several times. This indicates that Zuhel rules over strange and unknown things, mysteries, secrets, and matters generally considered hidden or taboo. He is not, by contrast, the god of public knowledge, like Mercury, and one does not approach Saturn to apprehend things which can be easily discovered by studies, in books, or via normal channels of information. Rather, Zuhail is a deity who guards secrets, grudges, things whispered, and mysteries that are buried by time or other forces. Zuhail is not the god of the researcher, so much as the god of the thief who steals the research of another. He is the patron of grave robbers and archaeologists who crack open the tombs and the secrets of the dead, only to hoard them in remote locations. Whenever a movie shows knowledge concealed in a secret laboratory or ancient secrets sealed behind vault doors, that is a manifestation of Saturn IX power. The sigil noted above looks to be a partial rending of the better known Saturn IX sigil. Later, the Picatrix elaborates on Zuhel's influence. Saturn's power is cold, hard, and its core is made of misfortune, corruption, stinking, vicious, betrayal, and is scary. Saturn also, if he gets hold of any matter, 
It betrays, separates, and scares. It has the pursuance of gardens, rivers, plowing, farming, provides with a lot of money, cheapness, poverty, disputes, traveling to far, bad places. It also has the signs of depression, grudge, crunning, cunning, circumcision, refuge, no socialization, and every other matter which has to do with evil, forcefulness, jail, change, fatigue, hard work, weakness, corruption, truthful words, friendliness, determination, and old age, advocacy, building, depressions, fear, overmuch thinking, worries, experiences, anger, insistent, doing less goodness, concerns, sadness, difficulties, grimness, death, cheating, inheritance, accusations, old things, brooding, too much talking, the knowledge of secrets, the mysterious side of things, and if Saturn is retrograde, it holds the signs of disgrace and weakness. It also has the signs of binding insistence, restraint on certain matters, and if Saturn, as it is retrograde, happens to face another planet, it weakens that planet too. These passages reveal a great deal about the way that the Gayat Picatrix tradition understands Zuhel. The Picatrix here stresses terms that indicate fear, betrayal, age, and depression, sorrow. These do not present a very pleasant character of the deity. In fact, Zuhel seems to be personified as a grim, curmudgeonly figure. Significantly, it notes that the deity has dominion over secret knowledge which has been discussed above. There is a definite unpleasantness to the way the planet is described, as its odor is repugnant, reeking. Most significantly, Saturn is dark and dreadful, even menacing. If a plant, stone, animal, or place is rough, bitter, foul-smelling or foul-sounding, or dark-colored, it belongs to Saturn. These traits are considered distinctive attributes of Saturn and reflect how Muslim magicians understood the nature of the deity. In going beyond the Picatrix, we note that its compiler repeats the earlier words of Ibn Washiyah, that Saturn is cold, at the risk of restarting what that transmission has already explained so clearly. We should alert the reader once more to the important fact that Zuhel is understood in this particular is. Islamic tradition as a cold, harsh, distant power. Zuhel is the icy, harsh power that embodies restraint, which can come from sickness, weakness, age, imprisonment, isolation, and even death. He is the deity that symbolizes restraint, and his influence corrupts and distorts the power of the other planets to the point that the Picatrix tradition warns against attempting planetary magic. If Saturn is adversely placed or retrograde, as the tradition holds that Saturn's restraining power will limit or distort an otherwise successful magical working. This is echoed strongly towards the end of the Picatrix in Book 4.4, where the text relates the secret natures of the planetary intelligences. Of Saturn, it says, The secret nature of Zuhel is the power of restraint, sealing secrets, destroying lands, troubling the heart, and becalming waters. Clearly, the Saturnine deity is not only able to overpower human affairs, but to restrain the workings of other deities. Like Nabataean agriculture, the Picatrix considers several spells for contacting the Saturnine deity. These will be discussed later, 
as recommended practices in Section 3, but it would be wise to explore one here. The Picatrix reads in Book 3, When you address Saturn, dress yourself in black. Betake yourself to the proper place on Saturday, having in hand an iron ring, and take with you a censer in which you place charcoal burning with incense. Having sensed the place, speak thus. O great master who possesses a great name and who is situated above all planets, you who are placed high and in an elevate, elevated place, you are the Lord Saturn, cold and dry, shadowy, author of good, true in your friendship, sincere in your promises, persistent and tenacious in your friendships and enmities, of tenacious and profound intellect, true in your sayings and your promises, unique in your operations, isolate, apart from the other gods, with sorrow and suffering, distant from mindless pleasure. You are the old one, the ancient, at once wise and a destroyer of good judgment. You mix good and evil. Sad and unhappy is he who vexes you. Happy is he whom you favor. In you are placed virtue and power, a spirit of doing good and evil. I demand, Father and Lord, by your high names and your marvelous actions, to do for me such and such. I call you by your names, O Halil, you in the seventh heaven, Zuhail, in Arabic, Saturn, Latin, Kivan, Persian, Kronos, Greek, Sani, India. This text echoes the element of cold and adds to it dry. It includes the dichotomy that Zuhel is far away, above all other planetary spheres, and it is good to note once more that Zuhel in Arabic actually means the distant or the alien. One notes also the dichotomy between good and evil since the invoker clearly hopes to gain one and avoid the other. This particular spell is also quite interesting because the invoker demonstrates the hermetic thinking that whatever entity he or she calls Zuhail in Arabic is the same entity that a European calls Saturn or Kronos, or a Persian calls Kivan, or an Indian calls Sani. It is significant that Saturday in Arabic is understood to be Saturn's day, despite the fact that in Arabic it is simply called Yom Arset, meaning the seventh day. The, te the text describes, finally, the people who are most vulnerable to Zuhel's influence. Saturn is used to ask for needs that you desire from chieftains, nobles, presidents, kings, old people, and dead people, criminals, recipients, the people benefiting of inheritance, heroes, deputies, peasants, builders, slaves, thieves, parents, grandparents, and prominent people. And if you're sad or sick with a deadly disease, and every other similar request of the same nature asks for it from Saturn, with the help of a drawing that I will make for you in Book 4.7. This is a very broad list of people and professions. On the one hand, it can be understood to be, a to be a list of people who have natural Saturnine resonance. On the other hand, it can indicate that certain classes or types of people are especially vulnerable to Saturn's influence. Some of these, like kings and rulers, are shared by Jupiter, and others, like heroes, by Mars. Saturn, however, has several that are unique to himself, like criminals and the dead. <clears throat> it is noteworthy that Islamic tradition and the pre-Islamic Arab and Persian traditions lack a coherent doctrine of necromancy because they did not really have a belief in the effective dead. They were certainly ahead of their time 
in having celestial magic and elaborate hierarchies of spirits and angels. But there are no records that relate to people working magic through ghosts, because these cultures had relatively few accounts of ghosts or phantoms. They were not taboo so much as they were ignored or discounted. Ghouls and spirits, however, were counted as being very real, and as Nabataean agriculture and the Picatrix show, the magicians of these cultures believed very much in the visible summoning of spirits, even in front of an audience. Nevertheless, Zuhail is said to have influence over death and the dead. Since necromancy is not an attested Islamic practice in text or contemporary folklore, we may understand that the dead refers to affairs that are related to the dead, such as inheritance or knowledge that disappears with the dead or similar such things. One notes also the curious passage quoted above on page 40 where the invoker prays, when we die, ward off the worms and reptiles from our flesh. Saturn appears to be connected to the state of the corpse, which has been interred at this point. As Islamic tradition holds that the spirit remains in the grave until the judgment day, perhaps the idea here is that Saturn can maintain the corpse, the abode of the spirit, in a better state than it might otherwise achieve. Nevertheless, Saturn has a very chthonic aspect and is connected to the soil, especially that which is subterranean. He has an agricultural nature, but this is related primarily to those things which grow underground, like turnips, not above ground, like corn. He is also the lord of the deep, dark places, like caves, caverns, graves, and things which have been buried or blackened with time, and also those animals which live deep underground. This is a very interesting feature for a planetary deity, which was thought to be far away on the very edge of space-time. Perhaps this is because, in the medieval mind, the deep underground is also a kind of far away, and closer to the subterranean kingdom which Zuhail was thought to inhabit. It is worth noting that in the Iranian tradition, which is part of the Picatrix, the distant Persian Kivan is said to be extremely old, extremely cold, and yet to be directly connected to the underworld. This seems paradoxical unless one accepts that the ancient Islamic conception of the Saturnine deity had the dual aspect of being alien and removed, yet also deeply subterranean. This is likely coming from the idea that the orbit Ekling, of Saturn was understood to be spherical, and so Saturn must be as far below us as he is above. And so those deepest places in the earth become sacred to him by virtue of their being distant from us. Saturnine Appearances Theophanies In considering the Islamic understanding of the Saturnine deity, it would also be good to consider the way that the deity is said to manifest visibly when it is called. It is understood that the deity's manifestation is a literal phenomenon but also that its panoply is symbolic of the Saturnine deity's qualities. While the Nabataean agriculture is generally silent on the appearance of Saturn, the Picatrix and the Kita el Ustawas both provided some visual description of the Saturnine theophany, the divine appearance, and also the idols of Zuhail. The Kita el Ustuwatas is a curious Islamic text which transmits a Saturnine anecdote from India. The text relates that at a time when India was still uncivilized and people were essentially savages, there ruled a king called Saf Nadula. He had a dream in which Saturn appeared to him as a black man. 
and instructed him to convene all his governors together for a religious ceremony before the black stone idol of Saturn. Saf Nadula did so, and all 72 of his nobles came for the religious event. The nobles and the statue were incensed, and an animal was sacrificed before the idol. The black man emerged from the idol and bestowed one of his 72 spirits to each of the nobles, along with the secret name of that spirit, so that the noble would be able to invoke or evoke the spirit when he returned to his home province. The manuscript, interestingly, provides the name of the 72 spirits. In case some aspiring magician wishes to try such a ceremony at home, these spirits are said to have entered into the nobles and empowered them to be effective at civilizing the various kingdoms which make up India. It is worth noting here that one major distinction of medieval Islamic magic is that there is to be a recurring theme of a magician being able to evoke a spirit visibly before a crowd, with the expectation that the entity will appear in visible form. This tradition is also interesting because it connects Saturn with the earliest levels of government and depicts an ancient time in which Saturn is the only deity and the patron of the state. This is echoed by the Roman tradition in which Saturn is the founding deity of the Italian kingdom. In terms of the Theophanies, the Picatrix compiler cites two sources. One is the interpretation of spiritual talismans, and the other is the benefits of the rocks of Mercury. The first of these describes Zuhel as appearing as a crow-headed and camel-footed man, seated on a throne with a scepter in the right hand and a spear in the left. The crow and camel are both noted in the Picatrix as being Saturnine animals. The crow is a black bird with an ugly voice, and the camel is a tough, enduring animal with an ugly voice, and inhabits the deserts, Zuhail's territory. The crow represents wisdom and malice, while the camel represents endurance. It's also noteworthy that being camel-footed was a demonic attribute in the Arab folklore of North Africa and Andalusia. Even in contemporary popular culture, the demoness Aisha Kandisha is said to be a beautiful woman with camel's feet. This is analogous to Christian folklore in which the devil can be recognized by his cloven hooves. Zuhel is seated on a throne or chair because he is a sovereign and he bears scepter as a symbol of dominion and the spear is indicative of his ability to afflict harm or hardship. An alternate yet related description is the same but has Zuhel standing on a pulpit which symbolized that he is said to be a master of wisdom secrets and the religious sciences. The second theophany, described in Benefits of the Rocks of Mercury, des describes the Saturnine deity as a man who holds a whale over his head and is standing atop a dragon. This is a very interesting description, as dragons are curiously quite rare in Arabic sources, though more common in Persian or Indian. The dragon symbolizes dark, chaotic forces which are under Saturn's control. He is not spearing or killing the animal, like St. George or Archangel Michael. Rather, it is the foundation of his power. Saturn, in turn, supports the whale, which in Islamic cosmology supports the cosmos itself. This image makes Zuhal into a sub figure. Alternately, the same text describes Saturn as he stands atop a dragon. He stands atop a dragon and bears a sickle and a scepter. Alternately, just a large scythe and is robed in gray and black. 
the image on the right from Krakow Bibliotheca Jagiela Jagielenska, manuscript 793 from Pingray's edition. One notes that the scepter indicates dominion, and the Sith is the instrument of reaping. As one might expect, Saturn himself is clothed in dark colors, namely blacks and grays. As noted above, the Kita al Ustuwatas describes a Saturnine theophany from India in which the deity manifests in the dream of King Saf Nadula and then later manifests in public view after a ritual is publicly performed. The deity appears as a dark-skinned man, dressed in robes of black, green, and yellow. The black is chthonic, while green is a reference to the agricultural aspect of Saturn. The color yellow is likely a reference to the Hindu belief that Saturn, Sani, is the son of the solar deity Surya, and thus in all three theophanies one notes the repetition of the Saturnine deity appearing as a male figure in dark colors, gray or black. 